see. Um, Good to see you out here. I see somebody put me a patriotic top here on the pulpit. Thank you. I was looking for one of these this morning. Couldn't find one. I saw one around somebody's neck. I said, that's a nice tie. He said, you want it? I said, no. His wife made him take it off and give it to me. How about that? And ain't that a blessing? Now, that's, that's a blessing. I'm going to put that on and wear it tonight. I wish I had it right now on. I couldn't find one that had black in it, too, but it's got red, white, and blue. But I'm going to tell you, I, 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 I'd like to have that tie. Thank you, Brother Greg. Appreciate your generosity. I'll pay you for that thing after church. I hope it was cheap. <clears throat> anyway, it's good to see you out this morning. I'm sorry we are a little bit late getting started. The preacher, he's always running behind, so you pray for him. And uh, I'm glad you're here. This is a great day, amen? amen. Great day. We live in a country we can gather just like this. But it didn't come for free. It didn't come for free. And it's still not free to keep it. 
And may God give us wisdom, courage, and um, good judgment to make the right decisions so the next generation of people can experience what we're experiencing right now, freedom. It is very, very fragile. I heard a man say, if you ever lose it, it's hard to ever get it back. A lot of people I heard of Ronald Reagan said in uh, 1964, 56 years ago, a man came from Cuba across the ocean on a little raft and made it to America. And he was talking to two American men there, telling them the atrocities he came from. And the two American men said, boy, I'm so glad. We, we, he said, we, we, we ought to be grateful. We get to live here in America. And the man from Cuba said, no, I'm the one that's grateful. I had somewhere to flee to. If America goes away, there's nowhere to go. And the only way it's not going to go away is we turn our hearts back to the Lord because it was God that gave us this great country. And he's the one that can take it. Let me tell you, you think he can't allow it to be taken away? Ask the children of Israel. You ask them, hey, God's book, his word's perfect. His promises are true. And his judgments are sure. Nobody slips away and don't think they're going to get anything over on God. But he is merciful. Nineveh, a wicked, wicked group of people, Nineveh, who had terrible atrocities they'd put on people. When they heard judgment was coming, the Bible says they repented in sackcloth and ashes, and God gave them another 120 years. I'm going to start them a sermon already. I ain't even got there. Well, it's good to be in church, amen, on this Independence Day. It's not about hamburgers, even though I like them. It's not about parties by the house, and I like them too. It's about reflecting on the independence we have because brave men, mostly committed Christians. There's a few deists in the bunch, but even them held the Bible, God, and Jesus Christ in high honor. Said, you know what? It's, It's time we are going to declare ourselves a nation to put God, the sovereign, back on the throne not King George. Hey, I'm going to tell you, it's great to live in America. Is it perfect? No, but neither are you. But I'm, and this church ain't perfect either, but it's good to have a church. It's good to have a country, and I pray the Lord to help us to do what we can. It's our watch. God forbid that it goes away on our watch. We got to do something about it, but it started way earlier. The enemies of the cross, enemies of Christ, and the enemies of freedom are still out there. But we have the truth in God's word. And he's still able to save to the uttermost. I think we ought to give an invitation. I'll tell you what, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to sing. we got Jonathan's going to help us on our singing. He heard me singing. He said, Preacher, I need to help you. I said, Amen. So we're glad you're here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. It's a great day to be in church. Looking forward to fellowshipping and with the Lord and with each one of you. Father, we thank you for the great day, the great country we get to live in. Lord America, Lord, we take it for granted all the freedoms we have grown up with, all the liberties we've experienced, all the joys of the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation we have that we could come to a church like this. We can go knock on doors. We can proclaim the gospel on the streets without fear of the government telling us we can't do it. So, Lord, we ask you to help us to know what to do in these last days and the times when um, men's hearts seem to tremble with fear of standing up for what is right. Lord, give us the courage and give us the wisdom to do it in the way that please you. And may we stand for truth in the last days. We do thank you for the sacrifices of not only those founding this country, but the many who have maintained the freedom we have by the ultimate sacrifice, going to war, many giving their lives, others giving their limbs, giving their ability to even function like they did before they went to fight for freedom that we may have the liberties we do. So we ask you to work in our country. We ask you to help us to turn back to thee, to repent of our sins, of putting ourselves as God and not you as the God of this world. So Lord, guide and direct us as we look to your word this morning. Help us to see your hand in our country, see your hand now. And Lord, we pray to see your mighty hand working in the coming days, that this country may stand for righteousness, for justice, for truth, for the gospel be going forth off these shores, around this world, for the glory of your name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Find your hymn book. Turn with me, 126. Stand to your feet, 126. We're going to sing My Country Tis. We're going to sing some more patriotic songs tonight. And I told Caleb, he started to play the Star Spangled Banner. And I said, if you play it,
you start playing that, everybody's going to stand up and go to attention and put their hand over their heart. Amen. There's a time in our country when the tune started, people stopped what they were doing. It ought to still be that way. Amen. Amen. Brother Johnson, come on, come on. All right, page number 126, My Country Tis of Thee. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my father died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom bring. My name. have to hurry on because I got a late start here. A couple things coming up. Next Saturday, the 11th, we're going to go out and knock on doors. Be here at 2.30 if you want to be a part of that. So well, I'm afraid to go out and knock on doors. What will people say? Well, it don't really matter. Amen. You know, Jesus said, go ye therefore. That's a go. It really means as you're going. So as you're going through the week, but set aside a time on Saturday if you can work it out to be here. Uh, bring your family. We'll sign you somewhere. We'll try to go somewhere uh, and we can all relatively be kind of together. And that'll be coming up on the 11th, 2.30 on Saturday. And then the 15th, we're going to have the Bontrager family. And I forgot to bring, I've got some posters I want to bring tonight. If somebody will text me, remind me to bring them. Uh, you can take them. You've got a local gas station nearby. Uh, some restaurant will let you put a poster up in the window uh, the, of their family. They're going to be here and invite people to come. Uh, give a, we'll, we'll give a chance to him to hear the gospel. So be an opportunity. The Bontrager family is going to be with us on July the 15th. How many of you are glad you came when the Wisman family is here? I'm telling you, I, I like seeing uh, people that are singing and living for the Lord. And uh, praise God for them being here last week on Wednesday. And then we got our revival coming up, Brother Don Sable, uh, August 16th through the 19th. The greatest Bible expositor I know living today. You don't want to miss out. You think, well, I'm busy. I've got plans. I've I got, I got to do something. You're going to miss out on something I guarantee you're going to wish you knew, wish you had. And so if you could be with us, that's uh, August 16th through the 19th. And then uh, camping trip September 17th through the 20th coming up um, uh, in Rome Mountain State Park. Be a part of that. And then we got another thing. I just got this hot off the press. I can read it even up close because they wrote it really big. Skate day. How many of you like skate day? We're going to rent a skate rink, play our own music, have our own fellowship there. It's July the 17th. July the 17th. That's on a Friday, 10 to 12 o'clock, skate day. I know you young people will be excited about that. I feel like we're having a skate day in the parking lot. <laughs> Man, I've been seeing rollerblading and rip sticking and all that stuff out there. I'm thinking we might save our money and just do it out there. But those falls on that concrete are rather painful. So I appreciate you. By the way, you kids do be careful out there. This new site is open over here. So uh, people pull it in. I want you to be mindful of the young people out there, possibly on the concrete when you're leaving church. And um, you young people be mindful of cars uh, coming in and out of that uh, area out there. Lord willing, in the next few weeks we'll get this other side over here paved. Uh, not paved, uh, concreted. So we'll have that um, moving forward and uh, be watching for that as you come up to church. Uh, a little house cleaning issue here. The church cleaning list is up, signed up out there on the bulletin board. I didn't hear anybody say hallelujah. <laughs> we need to see some more names on it. If you can pitch in, it'd help. You enjoy a clean church, 
because somebody's cleaned it. And um, I know a lot of people maybe don't want to do it a certain way. Just do it, okay? Pick away and pitch in. Put your name on the list. I told my wife about that cleaning list. She said, why, why is our name not on there? I said, well, because you ain't put it on there yet. She said, well, you go put our name on there. I said, I'm going to do it. So I try to pitch in a little here and there, but I, I'm going to put my name on there so I can be a part of it. Now, one other thing, we got, some new tra- we got a new trash service, and it's, uh, we got trash cans out here behind the building. Everything that goes in there has to be tied up in a bag. Don't go out there and pick up a trash cup and throw it in there. There's a trash can right at the corner right here. Throw your cups, loose stuff in that big trash can with a bag, all right? And make sure the bag eventually goes out to the big trash can, okay? If you could do that, that would be a help to us. All right, anybody got anything else? I don't know of anything else. Jonathan, what's our next song? 388? 388. Now, this song is about uh, I shall not be moved. It's talking about it doesn't mean I'm not going to be moved at the invitation. It doesn't mean I'm not going to be moved by God. What it means is I'm going to stand on the principles that God has given me, and I'm not going to be moved. Ephesians, when it talks about putting on the whole armor of God, it says, Stand, therefore, and having all, having done all, still what? Stand. Don't compromise on what's right and just and true. Don't be moved. Brother Jonathan, come lead us. I'm going to put my tie on, by the way, if y'all don't mind. Savior, I shall not be moved in his loving faith. Like a tree that's planted by the waters, Lord, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, Lord, I shall not be moved. In Jesus, me, I shall not be moved. Jackson, get that wheelbarrow. We're going to take up our kids' Bible offering. I almost forgot it. While we're talking about taking up the kids' Bible offering, uh, don't forget, we did move our offering plates back out of the auditorium in the hallway there. There's uh, two offering plates, so you can drop your tithe and offering in there. Uh, many of you have chosen to exercise uh, your liberty. How about exercise your liberty? To use the online given at BibleBaptistEastTN.com. You're welcome to do that. Uh, many of you say, well, it'll help me. I can put it in there and I'll keep my budget and I won't get behind. Anybody ever got behind on giving you tithe and offering? You're not, nobody's seeing you, just me. I, 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 I've gotten behind before God. And God's rang my bell, reminded me, hey, you're running a little behind. And praise God, he provided for it. So uh, if you want to do that, you can give right out there after the service. Now, we're going to take our kids' Bible offering up now. Every penny goes to printing Bible. Somebody sent me a message the other day on my phone and said, uh, are you still doing the Bible printing uh, ministry offering? And um, uh, we like to be a part of that. Well, praise God, it's another a church that we don't be able to give. They can give straight to Mount Pisgah Baptist Church or to 
Um, uh, what's the name of the other one we support? I can't remember the name of it. I just left my mind right now. I'll try to remember before the service is over, but we'll put it up on the thing so you can know where to give. But every penny goes to printing Bibles and putting Bibles in the hands of missionaries around the world of people that don't have a Bible. Uh, I know I don't, I, we watched a video a lot long ago. I think they've given out so many million copies of the Scriptures. The John and Romans that you see out in the, pool, out in the uh, vestibule out there, the John and Romans we've sent to the Philippines, the John and Romans we sent around the world have come from the Bible print ministry. And so today, everything you give, the church is going to match. If you give a $10 bill, we're going to make another 10 and put it in there. We're not going to make it. We're going to put it in there. We don't print our own money around here. They only do that at Washington. But of the money they printed, we're going to put it in there, all right? We're going to double what you give. So, Caleb, play something on the piano. If you want to be a, a part of the kids' Bible offering, goes to Bibles, send, bring them on down. Bring everybody you got. There's some money right there. I'm seeing it coming out of the pews. If you're an adult, you want to be a part of it, hold your money out, wave it around. One of these kids will come get it. I love that sound. Drop them in there, boys and girls. There you go. I'm telling you, we're heading for the mark of $10,000. We're heading for $10,000, we hope and pray to put that many Bibles in people's hands around this world. And I appreciate your generosity, your giving. And um, keep going. There's some more. Keep playing. There's some more. I'll see some more. Anybody else? Anybody else? Any, anybody else? Anybody else? There you go. Throw that in there, Lydia. You can go put it in there, big girl. There you go. There you go. Put it in there. Praise the Lord. Bless your heart. That little girl had some stitches the other day, but she's recovering pretty good. She's a nap sicker. She's pretty tough. All right, anybody else? I saw one young person uh, just now, after they threw their money in the offering plate, began leaping and skipping down the aisle. You know what I call that? God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Good job. You know, well, we have some of that around here. It might get contagious. All right, let me think. Ain't we got anything else? Caleb, what else we got? Anybody else got a testimony right quick? Somebody got a testimony right quick? Uh, anybody got something you're thankful for? Anybody? I got one over here. Go ahead. I'm thankful for the country I live in. I'm Amen. For people who fought for it. I'm thankful. I can, you know, things we have we take for granted. I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for this church, everybody here. Amen. I'm thankful I'm here. I missed Wednesday. I'm thankful to be here. Amen. I'm, I'm glad, glad you're here too. Amen. Anybody else got a testimony? Brother Rowe? Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's a handful, let me tell you. Amen. Amen. Praise God. That right there is from the mouth of a Marine, all right? Uh, I'm not going to tangle with him. He's probably... I don't know how old he is, but I wouldn't tangle with him in 50 years from now, I don't think. But praise God. And um, living for the Lord, his son going to serve in our, our military, serve our country. All right. All right, we got a special? Who's singing a special? No, no special? Oh, my, I guess I better sing one. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Take your Bible. Turn with me. Uh, turn with me, and we're eventually going to get there. Put your finger in Psalms chapter 35. Psalms chapter 35. And then I want you to put your finger in 2 Peter chapter number 2. That's eventually where we're going to be heading. But before we do, uh, I want to look and uh, talk about a little bit about this great country God's let us live in. And I, I took the time this week um, to sit down. And, you know, it's a shame. I'm not going to say this. It's a shame. Most of us say we're Christians, but there are probably many, many Christians in America that have never read their Bible. I mean, never read it all. I mean, from cover to cover. And uh, those that have, I read about a man the other day, went to a church, and they had a plaque on the back wall, a big church, probably eight, 900 members in it maybe, and how few of people had their name listed that they read through their Bible in a year. It was very few on the plaque. But you know what? We're Christians, and we very seldom, uh, many, many Christians that call themselves Christians that go to independent Baptist churches, and other churches around the country have never really read the whole Bible. That's pretty, that's pretty sad, isn't it? By the way, it's still the number one bestseller. Right. Now, let's keep it that way, all right? 
But you know what? I, I dare say very few people in this room and maybe in America have really ever taken time to sit down and read the Declaration of Independence. Well, we know it and we celebrate it, but we never even read it. So I t- I'd read it back in school. I've read it other time, but I took time this past week to read the Declaration of Independence. But I want you to think for a minute about the birth of this country. And I want you to, I want to tell you, and it was in uh, September the 6th, 1774. About a year and 10 months before the actual Declaration of Independence was actually drafted and signed and sent to King George. But the birth of this nation was built on biblical, Christian, if I may say, principles. You'll find the founding fathers quoting the principles of the Bible, of the New Testament, of the teaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was not just some God out there in space. These men recognized when they used the word religion, they were talking about Christianity. Reads through all their writings. That's what they're talking about. They're not talking about just any religion. They're talking about Christianity. The first meeting of the Continental Congress was gathered together that September the 6th, 1774. It wasn't even in Independence Hall. It was in a hall called Carpenter's Hall, which is near the Independence Hall. It was gathered together, and this Reverend Jacob Deutsch was called to bring the meeting together. He opened this first meeting in prayer. And such a powerful prayer to Almighty God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the way, that's the only way to get to God, that the men there said, I would have ridden, I would have ridden a hundred miles just to hear that prayer. He said, it's worth three days on horseback to be present for that first meeting and the prayer that took place. At that meeting, they read four chapters out of your King James Bible. They read four chapters out of the Bible. One of those chapters was Psalm 35. I want you to turn with me to Psalm 35. When I get there, we'll be there. All right? Psalm 35. I told you to turn there. I didn't get there fast enough. Psalm 35. After the reading of this psalm, It so moved the men that were there. Many wrote about it. As a matter of fact, it was John Adams, I believe, if I can find it straight here, who it was that wrote it. John Adams wrote to his wife and said, I want you and your dad, please read Psalm 35. What an appropriate reading for the first gathering of the situation the colonies were in Psalm 35. This is what they read of the, one of the Psalms. Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Boy, I'm going to tell you, isn't that fitting for, they're talking about declaring independence from the most powerful country in the world over many, I think at least 30 or 40, 20 or, I, can't remember how many, I didn't count how many it was, different conflicts over the past 10 years they had tried to resolve with the king to no avail. This is what they read. Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler. Stand for mine help. Draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion to devise my hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. For without cause have they hid for me their net in a pit. Which without cause have digged for my soul. Let destruction come upon him that I don't unawares. And let his net, and let his net, net that he hath hid catch himself into that very destruction. Let him fall. You can read through this psalm and realize these are men, how this is in the Bible for the 
effort they're fixing to undertake in just uh, 18 or 12, 22 months later when they signed the Declaration of Independence. These men were divinely, rely, they were relied on divine help from Almighty God. These men, I can't imagine, here are a, a little group of 56 men that signed this Declaration of Independence. 56, how many, how many, I bet there's 56 men probably in here. Imagine 56 men to say, I'm going to put our name on a document that we're going to declare independent because we believe God is leading us to make these decisions. I'm going to tell you, it is a powerful, powerful document when you read it. I did take time to read it. This nation wanting to build a nation built on biblical principles, the principles of Christianity. It's not just any God they're talking about, not any religion. All religions are not the same. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If he'd have stopped there, they could say, well, you know, he's the way. But he went on to say the next part of the verse. No man, no man cometh to the Father. That's where, where's God the Father? He's in heaven. No man cometh to heaven to the Father but by me. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. They're not all the same. But I want you to know these men want to build a nation built on God's principles. Matter of fact, when they drafted the Constitution of the three branches of government, it comes out of Isaiah chapter 35, I believe. It's our lawgiver, our judge, and our king. We got the executive branch, the uh, congressional branch, we got the judicial branch. All that came out of the Bible. I mean, you, might, you got to imagine for what 5,000 and some odd years, uh, the earth the, had been governed by different forms of government. And where in the world, how did these men get these truths to draft what we're living in today? Um, it's incredible. It's just incredible. You know, I, I, I read one man after I read, he said, uh, when, when America... This 200 and some odd years has been under one constitution. France has been through like seven. These other countries, I've read some other, been through 12 and 13 different regimes of leadership. And here we are under one document. Incredible. These men are incredible men. Guided by a divine person. God Amen. Almighty. Amen. I read this Declaration of Independence and I Got it on my phone. I should have printed it out so I can see it, but I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I don't normally use my phone, but I'm going to use it for a minute if you don't mind, if I can find where it is on here. I want you to notice what they said. In Congress, July the 4th, 1776, a unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When the course of human events... It becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another... And to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God. They're talking about the God of the Bible. That's who they're talking about. When they, you read their writings, they're talking about the principles of Jesus Christ. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of nature's God entitled them a decent respect to the opinion of mankind requires that they should declare the cause which impeded them to separation. He said, we're going to tell you why we are led to do this. We're just not doing this carelessly and reluctantly because we want to be our own boss. No, they had tried and tried and tried to appeal to the king. He said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator, not by the king, not by the government, with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, and that's for the unborn too, amen. amen. And I'm telling you, God is going to judge our country, and it's judging our country for what we're allowing to happen in our country, and we ain't stopped it. How did it happen? How did it happen? It slipped in a little bit at a time. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. 
that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety, happiness, prudence, indeed will be dictate the governments long established should not be changed for light or transient causes. And according all experiences have shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are suffering. It goes on to say, and it lists all the reasons why we've made this appeal. We've done this, you've done this, you've done this, you've done this. And we appeal, we appeal, we appeal, we appeal. It goes on the end, and then it gets to the last verse, chapter, verse and says this. And with the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives. Well, that's a sacrifice. They had families. They were not all about, these were not a bunch of 18 year olds fixing to go to war. These were men with families, with businesses that had built their life in this country. They realize if I do this, I'm throwing it all away. But freedom and liberty to serve God and the dictates we believe are right and just and true is worth dying for. Patrick Henry said, give me liberty. You ought to read his whole speech. Man, I'm telling you, I read that thing too. Whew, let me tell you, that man was on fire. Give me liberty or give me death. With a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. These men said why they're doing what they're doing. Their reasons of why their appeals had failed. Their declaration of what they're fixing to do. And with the support of it, dependent upon Almighty God and His divine providence, we pledge everything we have. And we live in a country that desired to put God in his rightful place. That's how it was started. But it's a crying shame that's not how it is right now. And I believe we're feeling the effects of a nation that's turned its back on Almighty God. Where God and the Bible are honored Things go well. You think about it. When you honor God and his principles, things go well. Washington, George Washington, the first president of our country, can't believe they let him tear down Washington's statue. That is a crying shame. But I did hear some good news. I heard the president made a speech the other night. He said, we got 34 names of people that tore down these things and did this right, and we're coming to find you. Men are responsible for their actions. And ought to be held accountable at every level. God does it. Hey, if it's worth dying for, then it's okay to do it. But the cause for which some people are standing now is not a cause worth dying for. It's a false cause we're going to get to at the end of the message. We live in a country where George Washington said this, It is impossible... It is impossible, he said, to rightly govern a nation without God and the Bible. Right. Woo! Somebody would say, yeah. amen. Right. God and the Bible. Right. Well, I don't like that old Bible. Well, all it does is tells you everything there is to know about God. Yeah. I mean, everything he, we need to know. Not everything, you know. not everything there is to know about God, but everything we need to know about God is contained in your Bible. Yeah. Matter of fact, that's all you know about God. Well, I've got these feelings about God. It don't matter how you feel. I don't live by feelings. I live by faith and facts of faith. Hey, this Bible is the, this is the foundation of what we believe. If you don't believe the Bible, then you're in a lot of trouble. You're going to have to pick some other set of rules by which you want to govern your life by. But I'm going to stick to the ones that God gave us. I reckon he knows better. You can decide you want to run your car however you feel like it that day. But if you pull out that old Ford manual, that old Dodge manual, or that old Chevrolet manual, and it says, do this, do this, and do this, your car will operate better, last longer if you do the simple things the owner, the manufacturer, tells you how to run it. Right. 
It's the same way. It's as simple as that. Read the Bible, put God first, and let God make your decisions for you. Amen. George Washington said these simple things. He said, it is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God and the Bible. As the conflict rolled on, we declared our independence. And the war went on for eight long years, by the way. That's a long time. Long time. Many people did without. Many people lost much. A lot of things. I'm going to tell you, war is an ugly thing. I've never been in war. And I thank the Lord I haven't. But I praise God for the men and women who went to war to fight on the behalf of right and just and true and freedom we live in America. I'm going to tell you, I've never been in it. But I tell you, it sure does something to you when you go through the heat of conflict that many of these young men have been through. Many of the people probably in this room have been in battles, been under the fear. I mean, some people just freeze under that and can't even function. Oh, I have never been in that. I've only had dreams about it. I had dreams about it. Terror, just sheer terror, not able to even move. You ever woke up with a dream like that? Couldn't even move? These men really went through it. Well, as the war went on, Benjamin Rush, who was one of the signers of the uh, Declaration of Independence, one of the signers of the Constitution, who was uh, uh, one of the leaders there, Benjamin Rush leaned over to John Adams, who was the second president, and asked him, he said, hey. He didn't say it like that. He didn't say dude either. Benjamin Rush, I read this as the war was going on, and it was seeing America have more battles lost than battles won. Ask Adams this question. If he thought that America could actually win the revolution. And Adams said confidently and adamantly, yes, if we fear God and repent of our sins. I'm going to tell you, between what George Washington said, that a nation cannot be rightly governed without God in the Bible, and what John Adams said, how do you win? Well, if we fear God and repent, that's the only way we can win. You can read declarations through this country, at least 14 I know of that came right down from Congress, de declaring a day of fasting, repentance, and prayer and imploring the God of heaven for mercy, direction, and guidance for the troops that were out there standing for freedom. I'm going to tell you, I'm glad to be a part of a country that started that way. Amen. The foundation where it started the education that was to maintain this world view of biblical perspective. You know, everybody's got a world view. A world view is how you view the world. You either view it from God's principles, from biblical principles, or you view it from humanistic principles. And how you view the world it depends on how you make your decisions. And I'm going to tell you, from listen, from 1600 and and uh, 90, it's before, it's 1690, that's before 1776, for y'all that don't know your math, people like me. 1690 to, seven, to 1930, the reading book that every American child learned to read from was the New England Primer. It was the reading book they learned to read from. You learn the alphabet like this. A, a wise son maketh the glad father, but a foolish son is heaviness of his mother. Proverbs 10, verse 1. This is how children learn to read. Not A, uh, uh, a, a, a apple. They learn a wise son makes the glad father. I'm going to tell you, have y'all ever had a sponge? Ever, ever had a sponge? I have a sponge like you wash your car with. A sponge? If you squeeze that thing out or you have it dry, whatever you stick that thing in first is what it normally absorbs. You think about it. You squeeze it dry, and whatever you stick it in first, it absorbs. It just sucks this stuff in like... After that, you can put it in as many other solutions as you want. 
but it'll never absorb the other solutions to the degree it absorbed what was first put into it. It's the same way with children. It's the same way with people. We have a whole nation full of sponges. And we're sending them off to school not to learn a biblical worldview. Public education, as long as it's teaching biblical principles, is just fine. Homeschooling, I believe, is the best. People say, what do you believe about a youth ministry? I said, well, I believe God has the great youth pastors, and they're called moms and dads. I think that's a good program. Now, there are children who don't have moms and dads. We ought to reach out to all we can. But I'm going to tell you, the best program God ever made was husband and wife, father and mother. It's a wonderful plan. I mean, it takes at least two of us on one to try to keep one of them boys straight. <laughs> and then you get outnumbered. You got 19 against two, and you got to just get them off by themselves. You go, you gang up on them. You know, two on one is always a good plan. They learn A, a wise son. B, better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Proverbs 15, 16. Every child learned to read reading those words. C, come unto Christ, or come unto, this word, come unto Christ, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and he will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. I'm going to tell you, you stick that little old sponge inside the word of God, and that's what he's learning, and everybody in his class is learning that, and everybody in their town is learning that, and that's the book mom and daddy learned to read from, and that's the book grandma and grandpa learned to read from, and that's the book that grandpa read by candlelight, that's the book grandma read by candlelight, and they open that book up, and you know what they got? They got sponge started sucking in the truths of a biblical worldview. Amen. Yep. Matter of fact, it goes all the way to Z, but I don't have time to give you all of them. Then they had another section that had rhymes. Wasn't necessarily a Bible verse, but a character lesson. A, in Adam, we, we all died. B, was some other rhyme. I can't remember. I didn't write it down. C, all the way through. The third section of this New England primer had another section that had the Ten Commandments and listed questions like this. What is the fifth commandment? What is forbidden in the fifth commandment? What is promised in the fifth commandment? What is required in the sixth commandment? What is forbidden in the sixth commandment? I'll bet you if I, had a, if I was offering a $100 bill for somebody to give me the Ten Commandments, it'd be hard to press for somebody to give me all ten of them unless you, I'm not, I don't have $100 to offer you. But I'm just thinking, what's the fifth commandment? What's the sixth commandment? What's the fourth? What, what are these? Those children knew them. You know why? Because they took that sponge when it was young and they just dipped that thing down in a pure solution Amen. for life's troubles and problems. In God's Word, it began to soak that in. And from 1690 in America to 1930, that was the book every child learned to read from in America. What's changed in our country? What's changed in our country? I tell you what's changed. We've given them some other source by which to learn from. You see, the foundation of the principles they built on was biblical principles to form a government on, to honor God, put Christ in his sovereign, God in his sovereign place in a country. The foundation of the education was built on biblical principles. Why do I decide I'm going to homeschool my kids? Because I'm not going to send them to a school that's going to teach them something that I don't believe the Bible teaches. All these people, they shut down schools and people started homeschooling. Amen. I hope they keep homeschooling. You can go to a Becca. Go on your internet. If you're out there watching it, go on to a Becca. They got a good curriculum you can get. It's built on biblical principles. You can still find that New England primer. They, they'll print you some more of them. They've got some of them somewhere. Go to wallbuilders.com, I believe, or .org and find them. They got the New England primer. You can order you one. Let that be your daily reading in your home. It's a good start. Well, I don't know how to homeschool. I'm going to tell you, if you get the Bible in children... You get the principles of God's Word in children, they can learn whatever they need. They'll have the tools they need. And if they don't have them, God can empower them with things they don't even know they need yet. You say, well, I can't homeschool. I'm not that smart. Have you met half these teachers? I'm just kidding. 
I went to school. I got my degree in education. I was going to be a teacher and a coach because the guy that led me to Christ was a teacher and a coach. I said, that's what I'm going to do in my life. I'm going to win people to Christ, and I'm going to go to school. I'm going to be a coach. I liked athletics, and I was going to be a teacher and a coach. You know, I got out of college at, whenever it was, 22, finally. Might have been 23, honey. I don't remember. I was married to my lovely wife, and I'm happy. I'm happy I got to marry her. But anyway, here I was. Got off on a tangent there. I got to school. I was supposed to be a teacher. Do you know how much I knew about teaching? About that much. I've learned way more homeschooling my kids than I learned trying to think I'm going to teach in a class. I see these. I went to school with some of these people that are teachers now. I'm, and I'm not knocking teachers. There are some great teachers. I had some great teachers. I had some people that really loved God that were great teachers. That man led me to Christ, the greatest Christian I've ever known. Incredible man. Credible teacher, credible communicator, credible coach, incredible person. But I'm going to tell you this. I know a lot of them coming out of there. They don't have the same goal you got with your children. I got with mine. But if you send a little kid to school and he comes home and his mom and daddy says, the earth is only 6,000 years old and God made Adam and Eve. But his teacher said something different. You know what the child's going to believe? They're going to believe their teacher because their teacher knows. We give, a t whoever teaches you something, you earn their, you, th th you get their, you, you give them respect and honor. I mean, I remember, man, my mom and daddy said one thing. My teacher said nothing. Uh-uh, my teacher, uh -uh, my teacher said this. Well, my teacher was only 22 years old. My dad was like 40, and my teacher was 23 or 24. They just hot out of college. What do they know? I'm not knocking the education system. I'm saying they're teaching the wrong things. Right. I am knocking that. Amen. Because, listen. You, this book is what our families, our children ought to be learning. Amen. The problem is our sponge of our children is so full of humanistic ideology and humanistic reasoning and no biblical truth or absolutes. They don't know what's right. And all of a sudden you're going to dip them into church when they're 20 years old and think they're going to absorb some of it when they got all that other stuff. you got to squeeze all that stuff out of them. And that's hard to get it out of there. That's why we ought to put the good stuff in first. Put the good stuff in first. Their education system was, you know what? George Watch said, it's impossible to govern a nation without God and the Bible. A people that know God, a people that know Christ, have bars on the inside to say, don't do that. People that don't know Christ, don't know the Bible, don't know God's ways, you have to put bars around them and tell them what they can't do because they don't know right from wrong. Right. It's just the facts of life. Right. If you're growing up teaching one thing's right and the Bible says something else is right, you better find what the Bible says. A foundation on biblical principles. An education built on biblical principles. How many of you know the biblical principles are the things, it's the relationship to God that makes life worth living and makes life work? The reason our country's in trouble today, 1930, we decided, you know what? We're going to put some other books in there. We don't need that anymore. It's almost like, turn with me to Psalm. Go back a little bit to Psalm chapter 2. Well, I'm not, this is all introduction, by the way. I'm just letting you all know. I ain't even got to the message I'm going to preach yet. This is the introduction about our country, okay? Here's, here's where we are in America. Why? See, feel like you're not even reading. The, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth or the people of the earth, you can put in here. I'm not changing the Bible, but you can put yourself. Of the, earth, the, of the earth set themselves and rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from, from us. That's what America's saying right now, these people that are rotting in the streets. We don't want people telling us what we can do and what can't do. All this new age world of new morality. Let me tell you, there's one morality. It's either moral or it's immoral. And that's determined by the Bible, not by what we feel like or want it to be. So we're going to throw these bands off of us. If we fail to be, as George Washington said, 
govern this nation by God and the Bible. And if we fail to fear God and repent of our sins, we'll find ourselves enslaved. Enslaved to our own terrible, lustful habits, passions, and vices wreaking havoc and destruction in our country. See, 1960, just 30 years after the New England Primer ceased to be the book read and learned to read by in America, they said, you know what? We don't want prayer in schools. We don't want the Bible in schools. Later, we don't want the Ten Commandments in schools. We don't want them in the courtrooms because somebody might obey them. Thou shalt not covet. What's wrong with that? Thou shalt not kill. What's wrong with that? Thou shalt not bear false witness. What's wrong with that? You see, the sad thing is our foundation was started well. Our education supported the foundation, which kept America on the right track. But now the foundation is gone because this new generation of young people growing up in school, they're not hearing what you're hearing and I'm hearing. They don't know what absolute is anymore. But I'm going to tell you, the absolute has not changed. A book I read was written in 1993. A little book I read on uh, America's founding. and said after 1960, I had to take a picture of these too. I can't remember where they all are. 1960, when they made these rulings about taking God out of schools basically, you can watch on a graph the birth rate for unwed girls 15 to 19 began to go up and increased over 400% over the next, from 1960 to 93. Sexually transmitted diseases did the same thing. You can watch the graph. Every one of them goes straight up just like this, starting, guess when? In the 1960s. There was a lot of other things going on then in the 1960s, but it was a fruit of, I believe, taking the education away from biblical principles to worldly principles. I don't have time to read them all. Now, let's get to our message. Turn with me to 2 Peter. Now, I said all that to say this is what's happening right now in America. 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, I'm going to be brief. It's only three short points. I mean, they really are short. They're only about five foot two. All right. 2 Peter. Some of y'all finally got that. 2 Peter. That's way back there with 1 Peter. And before 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then after James. All right, here we go, 2nd Peter. Now, I want to tell you, Peter is warning the church, okay? He's warning believers. He's telling them, you know what? Times are going to get rough. Let me tell you what's going to happen. He says, what's happening right now? 2nd Peter chapter 2, and this is what's happening in America. This, I'm, the message is short. The introduction is just long, okay? Here's the message. He said, what's going to happen is... Verse number 1 of 2 Peter chapter 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who probably shall bring in damnable heresies. People are bringing in damnable, that means condemnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of hey that's what's happening it's happened in the church it happened in the church in peter's day it's happened in america people they're false teachers they're false prophets what that means is they're liars they're telling lies they're promising you something that they can't deliver and that's our text. You're going to, you read the whole chapter. We won't have time to read this morning. Verse number 18, come over to 18. You read all these other things. You're talking about, hey, when that happened, God judged in Noah's day. God judged the angels in their day. God judged Sodom and Gomorrah in their day. When lies came in, boom, God brought judgment. God brought judgment. God, God brought judgment when people got away from God. They taught lies and heresies, and it led to immoral living, ungodly living, turning people away from the Lord. 2 Peter chapter 18, chapter 2, verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity. Doesn't that sound like people on television? Oh, they're telling about what are they going to give, what are they going to do. Don't believe a word of it. They allure through the lust of the flesh. Gimme, gimme, gimme. And through much wantonness. i got to have more. 
Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. Verse number 19 is our text. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought into bondage. Look at three things about this text. This is what's happened in our country. People are coming and telling lies. They promise liberty, but they can't deliver it. Because their liberty, you look at their life, you find out they're themselves in corruption. They tried that Chaz thing over there, blocked off this city block, put their gates up. You know what they got? They had murder. They had hired, they didn't want to call them policemen. They hired, uh, what do they call them? Peace officers. Who decided they were peace officers? Well, uh, who we thought were good people. Well, they're killing little kids. I'm going to tell you, they promise liberty. Peter's warning us, hey, listen, you got the liberty, you got the truth in Christ, you got liberty in Christ to live. Freedom is not the power, the right. Freedom is not the right to do what I want to. Freedom is the power to do what I ought to. True freedom is found in Christ. True liberty is found in Christ. When you know him, it's almost like this. When you're born and you're lost without Christ, your car can only go in reverse. You think about it. Every time you try to do good, you end up going backwards. You think good intentions, you plan good things, and every time you push the gas, it goes backwards. But when you get saved, all of a sudden God installs a drive. And then you have a choice to go forwards or backwards. You didn't have the power to go forwards before you were saved. You could just, everything you did was just, you, everything ended up doing the wrong thing. What I wanted to do, I couldn't do. What, I mean, it's like it's, you all, all you had was reverse. But you got saved and God put a new transmission that has forward and reverse in it. Now you've got the choice, the liberty to choose to do right, to go forward. Or you can still choose to go backwards. you still got to reverse. And it's a choice now, but now you've got the power to go forward that you never had before. Peter tells them three quick things. They promise liberty. Say, oh, you can be free. You just need to get these rules off of you. You can be, what you got is you got a false promise. Promise liberty, but it only yields slavery. I'm not talking about slavery. Back they talk about slavery. I'm talking about slavery. People that are enslaved to sin. They can't break free. Oh, I can quit anytime I want to. Well, why don't you quit? I don't want to. That's the problem. You're still in reverse. You need to get some liberty in Christ. Get your drive put in there. You should have the power to say, I don't want to. When I got saved, God changed my want to her. Right. Amen. The liberty in Christ changes your want to her. The want, what you want, now, is it still there, temptation to do evil? Yeah. But you got to want to her. says, no, I want to do good because you got the Holy Spirit living on the inside. Right. Number one, you got a false promise. They promise liberty. They truly deliver slavery. If you don't believe me, ask Adam and Eve. God is keeping something from you. You need to eat of that. You'll be just like God. Man wants to be the God of his own world. Problem is, there's no way to do it. Once you partake of that fruit, you're enslaved. You're enslaved to the passions that you thought were going to bring you liberty. Number one, the world is offering a false promise. In the day we live in, they're trying to overthrow America, overthrow a country built on biblical principles, throw out the education, throw God out. They're telling you a false promise. They're going to give you liberty. No. They're going to give you bondage. Slave to your own sin and slave to them. Number two, you got filthy promisers. That filthy is a strong word. But you got filthy promisers. Look at the lives of the people that are promising you liberty. Is their life categorized by love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, the fruit of the Spirit? Or is it. Qual- or, or, or is it or is it seen that it's the works of the flesh? Adultery, fornication, inordinate affection, concu- evil concupiscence, evil, sinful, sexual, immoral things and actions. 
hatred. Ha you ever seen such hatred on the TV? Hatred, strife, variance, wrath, malice. You ever seen so much of it? I'm going to tell you, it's a filthy promiser. The person promising you liberty ain't even free themselves. They're full of hate, bitterness, wrath, sedition. I mean, it's right there. Look in Galatians 5. The works of the flesh are manifest. You got a false promise. Promise you liberty, and they're really giving you slavery. Number two, you got a filthy promiser. Look at the lives of the people that are promising this kind of liberty. I'm talking about in the world for Christianity, and I'm talking about in America for the system they're all wanting to offer. It's an ungodly, it's not built on truth. What did Washington say? It's impossible to govern a nation without God and the Bible. How did Adam say we're going to win the war? If we fear God and repent of our sins. Right. Number three, I told you it was a short sermon. You got a faithful premise, a faithful principle. So number one, you got a false promise. We're going to give you liberty. Number two, you got filthy promisers. They themselves are servants of corruption. And then the principle is this. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. The faithful principle is whoever overcomes you, whoever you yield yourselves to, his servants you are. That goes for evil and for good. Hey, when you give in to sin, when you let the lies of the devil tell you it's okay to do what God says don't do, don't get, what you do is, what you're saying is, I want to be a slave in the shackles of that sin. Smoking, drinking, chewing, pornography. What you do is you think you're getting liberty, but all of a sudden you sign up and, man, they put the shackles on you just like that. I'm telling you, they lock you to that computer, lock you to that phone. Every free minute, you got to sneak off and look it on your phone. You're a slave. You ain't a slave to God. You're a slave to your sin. Every time you got free time, you sneak off and do something you shouldn't. Well, I got to just have another drink. I got to have another smoke. I got to have another look. You're a slave. You ain't free. They promise liberty. The principle is, whoever you yield yourself to, whoever you overcome of, that's who you're brought in bondage to. Being in bondage is not a bad thing. Oh, Paul, what did he say? I'm a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm a bond slave. It's okay to be overcome if you're overcome by the right person. Amen. Not by sin but by the Savior. Because when he overcomes you, you become his slave. I'm going to tell you, he treats his slaves good. Amen. Paul said, I'm a servant by voluntary. I volunteered because he bought and paid for me. I want to serve him. Christ is my owner. When he was in prison, he didn't say, I'm a prisoner of Rome. He said, I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Because he knew God's in charge. Hey, if somebody is going to be your master, you want to be God. Yeah. Not sin, not the world, not its lies. I'm going to tell you. It's a faithful promise of whom we've overcome. That's whose servant. That's, it says, of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. There's a fellow walking down the street one day. I'm going to close with this. Had a big old sign. You ever seen people have those signs, big old billboard sign on one side, and, and they, it's got a, you know, some, some ropes or something on the top, and they walk down the street, and you know, they'd be advertising or something. Well, this man walked by, and he had a big on the front of his sign said, I'm a fool. I'm a fool for Christ's sake. I'm a fool for Christ. People say, oh, look at that old dummy walking down with that sign. <laughs> He's a fool for Christ. What's he mean by that? He's a dummy out here. He's a weirdo. He's a freak. And he walked on by, and the back of it said, whose fool are you? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Woo, 
I like that, don't y'all? I don't, I'm not too sarcastic about things, but I do like stuff like that. I mean, it makes you think because everybody in this room, everybody on this earth living today is serving somebody. You've been overcome by somebody. No, 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 not me, buddy. I'm my own man. Then you're saying you're a servant of yourself and the center of self. And the middle letter in sin is I. Satan said, I will be like the Most High. I will make my own decisions. I will be the God of my life. So basically, you're saying, I'm serving Satan because you're your own boss. You're, not, you're either serving God and you're his slave or you're Satan's slave. No, no, I'm my own slave. Well, there's only two gods in this world. The God of this world, the Bible calls him Satan, that deceiver, the devil, and there's God the Father. You see, everybody in this room, you may not have it written on your chest whose fool you are, but by the life you live, what you're enslaved to tells me whose servant you are. Right. Tells people whose servant I am. Because I might not be wearing a billboard, but my, my life is telling the story of who I'm in bondage to. Second Peter's writing, saying, you know what? False teachers are going to come in. False prophets are going to come in. They're going to promise you all these things. But really all they're offering is slavery. Because true liberty, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The right kind of liberty. The power to do what you ought. The power to do what I ought. Let's not be deceived in the day we live in. You young people, your sponge has sucked up some of the wrong things. Even though we've tried to protect our children. Tried to homeschool them. Tried to put biblical truths in their lives. Tried to build them Oh, suck up the right things. There's a lot of bad things still get sucked up in that old sponge. You know it? And I'm afraid to say a lot of times more trash gets sucked up in our sponges than our children's lives and our own life because of the things we allow in our homes and in our life. And we wonder why our kids are not having the right... You, you want to change the result? You've got to change the ingredients. If we don't change the ingredients in our country of what we're putting in our young people, what we're putting in our homes, what we're putting in our lives, we're not going to get a different result. Right. We're reaping what we sowed for the last 50 years in these public school systems that are not teaching God's ways, kick the Bible out of school, kick God out of school. We're reaping what, these universities that say the Bible's not true, there is no God, you came from a monkey and now you're acting like one. It's a shame. It's happened on our watch. Here we are. What do you do about it? You pray. You really have to pray. You repent. You clean up your own house, your own life, and pray God have mercy. That king of Nineveh, man, he heard about God's judgment coming. He said, oh, man, from the king to the pauper, even the animals, they said, we're going to fast and pray. Maybe God will have mercy on our country. If we don't change what was happening from the top to the bottom or from the bottom to the top. I can't do much about the top, but I can do something about the bottom. I can vote about the top. I can pray about the top, but I, got, I can do something about the bottom. Judgment must begin at the house of God. It's us. Our founders... Started something great. Benjamin Franklin was riding off after they drafted the Constitution. He said, what kind of, what have you given us? What kind of government have you given it? He said, we've given you a republic if you can keep it. Yeah. The only way to keep it is you've got to put the right stuff in the sponge to start with. The right foundations. Amen. In one generation, we could change this country. Just one. If we get a chance to. Because in one generation, they've changed this country the wrong way. And we let it happen on our watch. May the Lord help us. Let's pray. Father, we need your help. We, we say it. We've said it in the past just so casually. But we don't really believe it. But now we're watching the real fabric of the place that was founded on your principles. They weren't perfect men, no. But, Lord, they built a country on 
honoring you and the Bible. And Lord, we repent. We have allowed many things to steal away our attention. From sports to wrong heroes to television to idol to sinful practices of the internet and evil things. We've abortion in our country. All these things have come in. Lord, we just plead upon your mercy. Help us to do what we can. Bring to our mind and our hearts the things we should and could do. But first off, we know we can pray. So best we know how we humble ourselves during this time of invitation. And I pray we'll make our way to this altar and plead for you for having mercy on our country. I know one trip to the altar, Lord, we know won't change our whole country. But Lord, if we're not even willing to make our way to the altar to pray for your mercy, we don't even deserve it. Lord, have mercy on us. We as a church humble ourselves. Plead. Give us courage. Lord, give us humility. We seek thee and thee only. The only hope for this world is Jesus Christ, your Son. In your name we pray and ask you. Amen. Find you hymn number 153. Stand to your feet. Have God spoke to your heart. Let me tell you. There ain't no reason.